France TV meets from the coaching staff Kevin Phillips. You joined the coaching staff I think two years, just over two years ago. Um, we were filming some of training today. You still want to play, don't you? Yeah. Um, there's still part of me feels I probably could, but um, I try to keep myself fit most days. As you've probably seen after training, I try and stay out and do a little bit. But it's, um, yeah, you know, when needed upon, if we've got someone dropped out or an odd number, then, then the gaffer will ask for me to join in. I did that this morning and uh, Kevin Summerfield started the game off by passing the ball to me and it hit my foot and I fell over straight away and then the lads were in fits of laughter. So, you know, but on a serious note, yeah, you know, we miss, I miss playing, but uh, I, I understand that, you know, even training out there, if you, how, you don't realise how sharp these players are because you have a touch and someone's on you. So um, I reckon give me a crash course over a month, I'd be all right. I remember an open training session at Pride Park, not long after you joined the coaching staff, and I think there were shorter numbers that day. Mm. And you were back at Pride Park where you'd scored that hat-trick all those yeah. years ago, and you couldn't wait to No, you, uh, you reminded me that day. I hadn't thought about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, it was, uh, as I say, when I can, it's getting harder, let's put it that way. Um, but yeah, I'm more than happy to make the numbers up. But as I say, you don't realise how fit these boys are until you actually join in and, and watch them train. So yeah, part of me misses it. Part of me is quite glad that I don't have to train every day. Um, you impart your knowledge to players as part of coaching. That's part of the job. Does it help you that actually, if they say, well, well show me what you mean, mm. Kev, that actually you can show them what you yeah, mean? Um, yeah, I think it does. Um, you know, it's always, I always remember uh, actual fact, one of our ex-managers in Nigel, Nigel Pearson, who gave me my opportunity of coaching, said to me, it's a great asset, a great tool to have to be able to demonstrate, um, because players learn in all different ways. I've learned that in, in my coaching courses um, and, you know, watching players now and talking to them and, and, and actually coaching them, that players learn in different ways. And if you're able to actually show someone what you're after, then it is not a big difference. I, I go back and try and think when I played, what would I have rather had? I'd rather have had someone actually show me what you want me to do. Um, so yeah, while I'm fit and still flexible enough to, to, to show players how, how or hopefully try and show them how to do it, then, then it is a big help, yeah. At what point did you think coaching is gonna be for me? Um, I would probably say that uh, probably only in my last year of my playing career, um, and it was off uh, an off chance really playing at Sellers Park for, for Crystal Palace against Leicester and I'm walking down the touchline, I was subbed that day and Craig Shakespeare is walking along beside me, good friend of mine, the assistant manager at the time, and said to me, you know, actually just before the game, that you know, have you, have you ever thought about coaching? Because I know that Nigel spoke about possibly trying to get you here as a, as a striker coach and he planted the seed that day and, and, and once you know, we had planted that, I went away and I thought about it and thought about it. And then when the opportunity came to go to Leicester as a player and then the job was offered to me at the end of that season when we got promoted, I thought, yeah, you know, it's something that, that I'd like to pursue. Um, so I'd probably only say it was only a year before I retired. And what about doing all the qualifications? Yeah, well, it's, you ask any, any player that's had to do them, I understand it's a necessity, you have to do it. Um, it's, a, it's, a good pro, it's, a learning, it's a good learning process for someone that hasn't even thought about coaching, that hasn't done any coaching um, through his playing career. So, yeah, it can be a bit of a, a bit of a tedious thing, but, you know, it can also be enjoyable. And if you go into it with an open mind um, and, and willing to learn and take on board what people are telling you, it can be, it's a lot easier than if you go into it negative, you know, just thinking, oh, you know, I don't want to be doing this. I'm only here just to get the qualifications so I can coach. Then, you know, it, it can be tough. So, you know, I'm nearly there. I've just got my pro license to do. And at some point I will jump on that. So when did you start? I only started um, three, three and a bit years ago. Um, so I've managed to cr cram a level two B and A all in the last three years. And last summer was the only, my first summer since I retired where I could have the full summer without having to go on coaching courses. So yeah, that was quite nice, but um, I'm, I'm glad that I've done them now, let's put it that way. When you were playing, did you ever think about, again, this, this whole business about how did I do that? And because I've done that, would I ever be able to explain how I did that? Um, instinct, it played a big part in my career. And I would have to say that that's very hard to coach. Um, 
you can is it in football you've either got it or you have well i think you can get better at it um but i think you know when you look at the the natural goal scorers that this country's produced over the years the shearers the owens the fowlers the annie coles um you know when i actually look at their game and you analyze it they get in positions where you think i'm not sure whether you can coach that that's just an instinct that's being in the right place at the right, at the right time and and i would like to think that, that i had you know I had a bit of that, um, you know, I would at times find myself in position, I thought, well, how did I get here? I just tried to read the game, read where the ball was going to land. And don't get me wrong, I didn't get it right every time, but, you know, the, the more often you put yourself in those positions, then you're going to get opportunities. So, you, you, can you coach that? I, I'm not so sure, but, you know, you can coach the running along the line, timing of runs, um, getting across the near post, getting in the middle of the goal, getting fast hit. They're the sort of things that we coach our players, and, and you know, if you continue to do that re repetitive, keep getting into those areas, you will get goals. They always say on the commentary, the player was in the right place at the right time. Yeah, and and, and that's right, but that only comes, you know, by practicing every day. Um, but you'll also you'll also find players in positions, and and you've heard it in commentary say, well, you know, what's he doing in that position? The ball's at his feet, and and it's a goal. You know, I probably wouldn't have told him to go there, but it's just an instinct thing. Um, so, but being in the right place at the right time is generally either being at that near post, in the middle of the goal or far post. And losing your defender. Yeah, well, that, that's speed of thought. That's clever movement. That's being one step ahead of your defender. That's trying to outgun, outthink um, your opponent. Um, and and that, that, can, that can be taught in terms of sitting down watching video. Um, constantly talking about it, um, you know, working on it with a defender in training. So, you know, they're the sort of things that we do do. Um, so, yeah, at the end of the day, it's, it's, if you're defending me, it's me against you for 90, 95 minutes. And if I want to get the best of you, then I've got to stay sharp, I've got to be bright, I've got to make good, move, good runs, have good movement. And if you do that, then you stand a good, good opportunity of coming out on top. Has football changed massively since you started playing to now coaching? There's so much more, seems to be technical assistance available. Yeah, definitely. The, the styles of coaching are probably a bit different in terms of we do a lot more technical stuff than what we did maybe 15, 20 years ago. Um, as you'll see, most days in our sessions we'll start with a technical drill in terms of a, a bit of passing. Um, uh, training stopped, and you know, much more nowadays to talk about technical stuff. Um, whereas, you know, 15, 20 years ago, it was just throw a ball in the middle. Occasionally, it would get stuck, uh, and just go out and get on it. So try and solve. I think what I found more back then was players solve problems more themselves out on the pitch. They didn't need the coach to have to keep stopping it. You know, they would they would solve it themselves. So. Has that got to do that we, we, we certainly pamper our players a lot more nowadays, but you're trying to give them the best of everything. So it has changed, but at the end of the day, you know, football's football. You know, no one's reinvented the wheel, have they? It's who scores more goals than the other. It's just about, you know, who can do it the best. But you just think of the analysis that's done on football. In football programmes these days, so whether it's on Sky, the BBC, or wherever, they will stop a move, look at it, they can move players here and there using their magic screens. And I just wonder, sometimes is it maybe a bit too complicated and it is almost get back to, as you said, chuck the ball in the middle yeah. and get on with well, it? Well, it can be complicated and, and it just depends how, how complicated you want to make it. I've been at, you know, I've been at what, nine clubs in my career and certainly later on in my career when you know, more sports science were coming in, the analysts, pro zone, um, huddle, all this sort of stuff. You know, you can absolutely analyse everything to death if you want to. And, you know, I've been in meetings where managers and coaches have thrown so much information at you that you just, you know, when you come out of that meeting, if you'd have asked me what they spoke about in the first five minutes, I'd have forgotten. So you have to be careful how much information you give. Uh, it's a tool there if you want to use it as an individual. Some, as I said earlier, you know, players learn in different ways. Some players learn by watching video, looking at all the stats, analysing their own performance, which is fine as long as that gets the best out of you. But I think collectively, if you give too much information, it, you know, especially to footballers, they switch off after 20 minutes, believe me. Um, it has to be short and sharp, um, but it's there if they want to use it. Did you used to use it when the opportunity came? No, nope. I have to say, I... 
you know, I wasn't one of these people that would really study my opponent, uh, opponents or the team. Yes, I would sit in, obviously, in meetings and, and listen to what the coaches and that uh, presented. But me personally, as I said, it was about me against you. And I always felt that I would come out on top if I did what I'd been doing. Um, you know, just trying to outgun you, outthink you, outwit you. Um, and, and one of my biggest things was, at the end of the day, I wanted them to worry about me, not worry too much about you know who I was up against. I'm sure you'd enjoy looking back and watching goals that you'd scored, but would you sit down and watch games you've played and thought, I could have done that better, I could have done that better, all that was good? No, if I'm being honest, no. I would, I would very, I would quite often, every, certainly every Saturday morning, if we had a home game, I'd sit and watch my goals videos. Um, just to try and get me focused, get me in that right frame of mind. Um, but in terms of actually sitting and watching the whole game, um, you tend, I tend to have done that obviously a lot more since I've come onto the coaching, coaching side, so you can pick out clips. Um, but in terms of when I played, not really, no. You know, I, I know if I'd had a good game, I know if I'd had a bad game, I don't need to sit and watch the video to think that. So I would, be, I would more analyse myself after the game about what, what do I think I could have done better, what, what couldn't I have done better. And I use probably the drive home after the game to, to think about that. And as soon as I got home, I tried, if I could, to switch off, um, which was very hard sometimes. But, you know, my thought process would be the drive home after the game. Let's just on that. <clears throat> Saturday afternoon, three o'clock. Games gets played, final whistle, win, lose or draw. You go home <clears throat> and sometimes fans, if it's not gone well, think they didn't care about that. They'll be out tonight on the town having a few beers and whatever. It just doesn't matter. It does matter. It does. Uh, I can understand, you know, when you see players out and about on a, on a Saturday, and we've seen it so many times, um, you know, perhaps doing what stuff they shouldn't be doing um, after a game. But, you know, we're all human. We all react in different ways. And, and, you know, I think in general, when you look at how many people have done it and it's been cool, it's, there's, that, there's hundreds and hundreds of footballers. And, you know, the ones that get highlighted are the high profile ones when they do it. You know, they, 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 players are allowed to wind down um, how, that, how they see fit. Um, and, you know, I, I personally, yeah, I used to enjoy, I used to look forward to my game on the Saturday. If we didn't have a midweek game, I used to look forward to having a few beers on a Saturday night. Um, but I certainly didn't not care if we had lost the game. It was still hurting, but it was just a way to try and unwind. You know, you'd still unwind, do it the, the same if you'd, if you'd won or drawn. So, you know, people react in different ways. And, uh, you know, I always felt that I'd earned that, that couple of beers on a Saturday night because it's been a tough week. And if you'd had a tough game, then it was that way of unwinding. So to say, to suggest that players don't care, I can see why people think that. And I have actually seen it, you know, that do you really care? You kind of question, but I think deep down they do. I guess around the turn of the century, the 20th into the 21st century, when you really then hit the headlines, you were leading goal scorer, golden boot, the attention must have come on to you. Did you at any time feel that that attention had overstepped the mark? No, I, I think I was very lucky actually in terms of you know, the attention that I got, the media scrutiny. Um, I, was, I was very much a a down to earth, kept myself to myself, quite a quiet guy. Yeah, I liked a night out, I enjoyed my, uh, my, my fellow um, professionals company. Um, there were probably mm -hmm. times when we did go out a bit too much, um, but that, that it, it was in an era of when, you know, team spirit was massive. And I don't see that enough in football nowadays. I don't see enough team spirit, I don't see enough as all Is that players. because maybe they fear going out because everybody gets the mobile <laughs> phone out? Possibly. But don't forget, you know, there's a lot more different um, mentalities, a lot more religion, a lot more foreigners in, and, and you know, they, they all live differently. Whereas back then, you know, generally teams were made up of British players that, you know, let's face it, have been brought up with, you work hard and, and should I say it, you play hard. Um, so, you know, times have changed, but I think, yeah, social media has killed it an awful lot because you can't do anything nowadays. Um, so. You know, it's just something that, unfortunately, you, you, that has to be dealt with. Never say die, get knocked down and get back up again. I think that would uh, pretty well describe you as a, a young lad, wasn't it, in football? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, it wasn't a straightforward upbringing in terms of my football path. Um, 
I suppose from, from the moment I could walk, um, I was always had a football under my arm and that was all I ever wanted to do. Um, perhaps didn't pay too much attention to school as I probably should have and, and, and I'm trying to drum that into my own children's head that school is very important. But I, I was so focused on I wanted to be a professional footballer. Um, uh, so, you know, when, when I did get my, as you call it now, scholarship and apprenticeship then down at Southampton, it was like, you know, it was, it was unbelievable. You know, it was like my dreams had come true. I packed my bags down to Southampton. I went for two years and enjoyed every minute of it until that last day when I was told that, you know, you're not going to be taken on. And, and that's kind of like my world come crashing down on me then. And, you know, part of me thought, well, is that it? Is it over? But then the other part of me, which was probably 75, 80%, was I ain't finished here. You know, I ain't going to let them knock me. The last thing I said to Chris Nicholl when I walked out that door is, I'm going to prove you wrong. And to be fair to him, he said, I hope you do. Um, so I went away, wrote to every club in the country, got two replies. Sorry, we've already taken our full quota, you know, but we'll keep you, you know, we'll keep you on the radar. Um, so I had to play non league and. You know, my attitude was just keep going, keep going, keep going. Stay in on a Friday. Don't go out with your lads. Don't get sucked into that temptation because you play well on that Saturday. Hopefully you'll get that opportunity. And, and, and I was lucky that it did come in terms of Glen Road assigning me at Watford. It's interesting. You're not the first former player or player who said that, that they're staying in on a Friday night because Saturday was still football, albeit non-league football, that... That must have been so difficult because the temptation's there. Yeah. Your mates are going out. Come it on, it yeah. was, and I'm not going to say I'm sitting here as a saint and said no every Friday. Believe <laughs> me, but um, you know, more m more so than not, I would I would stay in on a Friday, and I had a, I had great support of my dad, um, who at times wouldn't even let me answer the door. He would go and answer the door, and, and don't forget, you know, I'm a I'm a 20 going on near 21 year old lad, and you got your dad saying he ain't coming out tonight, <laughs> so. I uh, got a bit of stick for that, but if he hadn't have done that, I probably would have gone out, you know, more than I should have, and and then I probably wouldn't have done myself justice on the Saturday. Um, so, you know, I had to be disciplined, and you know, I always felt that it would pay off. And you know, now that I'm retired and finished and had the career I did, I can go out whenever I want now. So, not that I do, but um, you know, it's paid off. Why did Chris Nichol and Southampton say, "Sorry, you're not up to scratch"? Well, I went there as a centre forward and, and was told straight away, sorry, you're too small at the moment, you haven't developed, we can see you've got potential, um, but we don't see a position as you as a striker as yet. We'd like you to have a go at right back because they thought I was pretty good coming on to the play, not so much at that time with my back to play and holding the ball up. So I went, well, well if, if that gets me in the team, then I'll do it. So And I did okay and I spent two years there. So. Unfortunately, I was competing against Jeff Kenner and Jason Dodd at the time, two, two players that went on forged good careers, um, and I just couldn't couldn't break in. So that was that was the main reason why why they released me. Did you have to get a real job? I did, yeah. You know, it's I tell people now I've got a real job when I say to them <laughs> that I get in at what eight o'clock in the morning, get home at five o'clock, and it's like oh boo hoo, you know, welcome to the real world, but. You know, I'm still doing something I love, but yeah, I had to go out and find a job. You know, all of a sudden realism hit home. You know, I'm I'm, I'm not on my own, so I've still got my family, but I've got to go out and try and earn a living. I've got to do something. And luckily, my mum at the time worked in uh, in the accounts department of a, a company called Sunbless, which was a bread factory just down the road, and she got me a job on the factory floor. And uh, all of a sudden, I'm working 12-hour shifts a day, and uh, it, it was tough. It was certainly an eye opener. Was there a time when they said to you, we told you you should have concentrated more at school and done those? <laughs> yeah, well, don't, yeah, I think certainly, you know, there was part of me that thought, thought that, you know, when I, when I was driving perhaps probably back from Southampton thinking, you know, what am I going to do? You know, it's not as if I can use my qualifications just to go and get a job. You know, welcome to the real world. Um, so I was lucky that my mum got me, got me in an opening there and... One of the people that worked in there knew the local manager of the local side, and at that time he was a bloke called Ian Allison, who used to play for Arsenal, um, and he invited me down for a trial. So um, I was lucky that, that my mum sorted that out as well. So I, you know, I had a lot to, to be thankful for her too. So in a way, there was that connection. Yeah, there was. Um, it was very lucky that there was a connection. Very lucky that Ian was happy to, to give me a trial and. 
once I got my foot through the door, then it was back down to having that desire, that hunger, the right attitude to try and try and succeed. And uh, with the support of my family, you know, it, it was, you know, it wasn't long before I was uh, doing again. Well, I hadn't sampled being a professional, but it wasn't long after that that all my dreams did come true, and uh, you know, I turned professional. So you're at Baldock Town. Yeah, Baldock Town, just down the road from Stevenage, where I'm from in Hertfordshire. Um, good little club. Um, as I say at the time, Ian was the manager. Uh, went along at a trial. Playing as a defender? Yes, I went as a right back um, and wouldn't say I totally enjoyed it because I had to go from playing kids football, jump straight to men's football and it was tough. You know, I still hadn't probably developed um, fully, um, but it took me a while to get into the first team, but eventually got in there as right back and I wouldn't say I made the right back slot my, my own, but um, you know, I certainly gave it a go. So it, it would, it would, I think it took about three or four months before I was converted to a striker. So how did that moment come about to take a position where you could get all the glory? Well, it was, um, it was a Friday. We were away at Burnham on the Saturday, Burnham Beaches. And you know, as time went on, it was actually where I made my England debut and stayed at the hotel there. So. Um, he called me on a Friday night and just said, Kev, um, you know, have you ever played up front? And I'm like, you winding me up or what? He went, no, have you ever, have you ever, because we, our strikers, one's uh, phone up six, said he's not going to make it tomorrow. We've got injuries, as you know. We're struggling for a striker tomorrow. And he says, and I've, you know, I've been a forward player myself. I've seen, you know, from training, watching games, you like, you know, you, even though you're right back, you like to run in behind and make those runs. I said, Ian, I said, I'd always been a striker. I said, you know, of course I'd love to have a go. So the next day I went up front, scored two goals and uh, never looked back, never played right back again in, in the rest of my life, apart from a couple of training sessions out here with the first team. So, um, yeah, that, that, that phone call from Ian that night changed the course of my career. That was the, that was the conversion moment? That was the turning point, yeah. If I'd have turned around and said, I don't fancy it, I'd, I'd rather stick it right back, then I certainly probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. Um, so... You know, I was buzzing the next day after scoring two goals and, you know, I started to make a bit of a name for myself pretty quick in, in the non-league scene, scoring lots of goals and, uh, and that was when the, the the attention came in terms of scouts coming to watch me uh, perform. Were you aware of that then, that you were starting to to get headlines? Yeah, yeah I was because, you know, as they still do now, they, they, they still had the non-league paper. Um, around in those days and I'd quite often buy it just to see my name in a paper um, and it was great but yeah you know my manager Ian who had a lot of contacts within the professional world was was saying to me look you're starting to, to draw attention to yourself um, you know there's people hearing about you they're sending scouts to watch you so make sure you're staying on a Friday night because <laughs> you never know who's watching on the Saturday so it turned out actually that the scout that came to watch me and eventually the scout that signed me um, watched me on a Tuesday night. So there's nowhere to go on a Monday night, so I just stayed in anyway. Um, so yeah, cold Tuesday night. Glenn Roder comes from Watford, watches me. I score a goal, didn't play particularly well. Um, and then I got a phone call the next day after the manager and he said he wants to take you for a week's trial. Uh, and the rest was history after that. So you've had two years at Southampton. It ends in disappointment. You've got a real job. You're playing non-league football, and now there is another opportunity. So what's going through your mind? I'm not going to let it slip. Simple as that. Um, you know, there's not too many people get second opportunities in, in their life in anything. Um, second chances. I wasn't going to let it, let it slip. Um, so, you know, I, I, first and foremost, I had to get a week off work. And luckily, the company at that time I was working for was Dixon's, the old uh, electrical company. Um, they said, yeah, no problem, take a week off, go and, you know, go and do what you need to do. And, you know, it was quite daunting, really, going to train with professionals, you know, a lad from non-league on trial. And at that time, you know, players were quite unforgiving. Um, you know, they're straight on to you. Um, and I had to, I had to stand up and be counted. I had to, all of a sudden, within, you know, a few days, I had to grow up a little bit um, because this was serious. Um, but they, to be fair to them, they made me feel welcome. I went in, I did, I did okay. And at the end of that week, we had a match away at Chelsea uh, at Stamford Bridge. And I went there and I hardly had a kick. Didn't think I played too well. And they had to make a decision on me on, on that Friday. And, and I remember Glenn pulling me to one side, Glenn Rode at the time, the manager said, listen, 
I was expecting the worst, fearing the worst. He said, I haven't quite made my mind up. He said, I'd like you to come for another week next week. Um, do you think you could get some time off work? I said, well, I don't care if I can or can't. I'll be here next week, no problem. So we had a game away at Millwall at the New Den on the Tuesday. Played a mu much better, played a lot better because I'd played with the lads on the Friday. Kind of got a bit of understanding on the Tuesday. Played the game. And I always remember afterwards, Glenn said, Kev, can I speak to you outside? And it was in the away, in the away dugout at the New Den. He sat me down and he said, listen, I don't want you to see out the rest of the week on the trial. And I'm thinking, he's going to release me. He says, I've seen enough. He says, uh, I want to sign you. And it was like, sorry. He went, yeah, I want to sign you. I want you to sign professional forms. Um, can you meet me at Wolverham Abbey uh, Hotel tomorrow um, to discuss your contract? And I went, yeah, definitely. Went there the next day with my dads, and I actually walked out of that room as a professional footballer, but on a lot less money than what I went in because I was playing non-league, earning decent money, I was working, and I walked out of that room on £300 a week. And before I went in there, I was on £600 a week. <laughs> but it, I would have played for nothing just to turn professional. And that moment, you know, was the best feeling I could have ever wished for. Did Dixon's give you that second week off? Well, it. It didn't matter because I never, to be fair, I didn't, I did a bit of a crafty one. I rang in sick on the Monday and I knew I had the game on the Tuesday and obviously if I'd have needed Thursday, Friday, then I probably would have found an excuse not to go in. But as soon as he said, we want to sign you, I rang Dixon and just said, you know, I'm finishing, I won't be coming back. Um, so, you know, I couldn't get that contract signed quick enough. You're 21 by this age as well. So, as you say, for a lot of kids, a lot of people that you'd gone to on trial to at Southampton, their professional career was probably three years down the line. Mm. You're coming in at quite a late point, aren't you? I am, yeah. It, it certainly had its advantages and disadvantages. I was going in, you know, certainly not as fit as the players that were training every day that had had that grounding for, for a few years. But, you know, I was a fairly fit lad and I think that's probably one of the reasons why I went on to play as late as I did. I kept myself fit, I did things right. You know, enjoyed myself when it was the right time. Um, but I was determined to do anything it took to get fit and to try and get into that first team and start making a name for myself. And it took a while. You know, I played a few reserves game. Didn't think I did particularly well. I was finding it quite difficult to adapt in terms of training every day, um, just the physical demand. Um, but once I got over that, I think I joined in the November, December time and then I broke into the first team in February. So it took me till February to, 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 to make my debut for the first team. And ironically, it was against Sunderland at, at Watford um, on a cold, awful Tuesday night, no uh, grass on the pitch. Um, and we I think we lost the game 1-0, but I thought I did okay for my debut. And uh, it was one of the proudest moments of my, of my career, having my, my family, my mum and dad in the stands watching me because unfortunately, that summer, my dad passed away, and my mum passed away three months after him. So I was very lucky that they both got to see me turn professional before they both passed away. So that's pretty, <clears throat> pretty tough to take, the fact that you lose your parents in such a short space of time. At, at actually a time where your career is about to start. Take off, yeah. Yeah, it was. And I'm not going to lie, I, when, when my dad passed away, it was, well, I've achieved what I wanted to achieve, be a professional footballer. He had a massive say in me getting there. Um, I was at such a low that I didn't want to continue playing football no more. So I was like, I've made it, I've been a professional. What's the point? What's the point in carrying on? Because a lot of me did it for my parents. Of course, most of it was for myself. But I have to say that Glenn Roder at that time, who was the manager, he was fantastic with me. Um, he'd been through a similar thing, so he was able to to say the right things, give me the right time off at the right time, you know, uh, look after me. And if it hadn't have been for him, I would say I probably would have finished playing football. Um, so, you know, I, I, I've always said it, and I've said it to him when I see him now. I've got everything. I owe everything to him, really, because if it hadn't have been for him, one, I wouldn't have turned professional, and two, I would have retired straight away. So, yeah, it was a tough period, but, you know, it certainly, as time grew on, I realised, you know, I need to do it for them. And uh, I really pushed myself, and, you know, my career just got stronger and stronger and stronger. 
Or was it a real low? I mean, that sounds a stupid thing to say, but... Yeah, it was Yeah, it was a real low because I got the phone call while I was on holiday on the end of season tour with, with Watford. On, you know, we're on a bit of a beano. Um, I had just scored nine goals in 15 games coming from non-league, so I was on a massive high. Then all of a sudden you get that phone call that just shatters your world. Um, and I had to travel back from Portugal, and luckily I had Kenny Sampson there at the time, who who flew back with me and was a massive help as well, him and Glenn Roder. Um, so yeah, it was a massive low, but you know I think it certainly made me stronger as time went on, stronger person, and was able to deal with a lot more that was thrown and thrown at me um, as time moved on. So I know I meant really you've got to stand on your own two feet. Nobody to, well, to yeah, go back to. What there wasn't then, there wasn't all of a sudden. I couldn't just pick the phone up or go, you know, go home and talk to a fellow, you know, another man. You know, it was who do I speak? I got four sisters. You know, when my mum was alive, you know, five five women in the house. It's not <laughs> it's not the best place to turn for advice. Yes, I had my mates, but you want to talk to someone with a bit of experience and that. So it was very difficult. And, and not long after that, I had to move. I moved to Sunderland. So I was up there on my own with my wife, um, Julie, and, and we were expecting a baby. So it, it was difficult, but you know, we we just we basically went for it and just thought, you know, we, it's either going to backfire or it's going to go for us. And I thought my time at Watford was successful. Why shouldn't it be successful up here? So tell us about the highlights of being at Watford. Um, making my debut, uh, meeting Elton John, <laughs> um, scoring nine goals in fifteen games in my first season. Fortunately, I got an injury quite early on there. It took me out for a year, um, which was tough. Um, but then coming back straight away and um, scoring a hat trick in I think my second game, and then you know finish the season strong. But unfortunately, we got relegated. Um, was offered a new deal with, by Graham Taylor, but wasn't happy with it. Um, and then it was right. We need to move on. The agent said, you know, we'll find you another club. Was close to shining for Ipswich. Um, didn't didn't happen, didn't materialise. And at the last minute, Sunderland came in. Peter Reid said, get him up here, I want to sign him. And the rest was history. I drove all the way up to Sunderland and, and signed on the dotted line and uh, had six wonderful years up there. Was that for more than 300 quid a week? Well, it was. I signed a new deal in that summer of the Watford. So I got in nine goals in 15 games. Signed a new deal. Um, yeah, so I, I think I'd signed two new contracts while I was at Watford. And certainly, yeah, when I went to Sunderland, it was pretty much at that time like winning the lottery. I didn't realise, you know, what the money they were offering me was, was quite incredible because only two, two big years ago I was on, you know, 300 quid a week. And, you know, now I've gone to, you know, I can't remember what it was at the time, but, you know, it was like I'd won the lottery. So, um, you know, yeah, it was fantastic, fantastic. You make decisions in life, and it's interesting, you know, you say, you stuck at it. I could have just said, right, I've been a professional footballer, but I've lost my parents, and maybe it's, okay, I've done what I needed to do. Going to Sunderland, you couldn't have imagined how those six years would have worked out when you made that long drive to the North East, could you? No, definitely not, definitely not. I went up there with the right attitude, the desire to, to succeed. Um, but you never really know how it's going to turn out. I'm going to a place where I'd only ever been to once when I played for Watford. And my first thoughts were then, I don't ever want to have to come up here again or sign for a club like this because it was, it was grim. You know, you ever, you've probably been to Roker Park. Um, it's a fabulous place. Yeah, it, yeah. Um, but it, it, it was, but I just went with the right attitude. It's like, you know, it's, it's, um, it's either going to work out or it's not. Um, I had a manager that believed in me which was a big help, you know, it was, I looked at the squad at the time and, you know, you had the experience of Niall Quinn there, um, Kevin Ball was the captain at the time, Michael Gray, you know, these players that were good players. Um, Lee Clark, who had just signed from Newcastle, was a big name. So I just thought, I've got to fit in and, and you know, I, I've, it's down to me. So, you know, I could probably, the first three years there, I couldn't have wished for it was quite an incredible start, to be honest. I always believed in my own ability, but to get 35 goals in your first season, um, for me, was just you know an, un an unbelievable achievement in, in terms of since it was my first year and only my 
in what my third year as a professional footballer. So yeah, it was fantastic times. Yeah, an interesting choice because most of people sound for Watford Gap. You know, don't don't venture too far north. So. No, I don't. As I say, I, uh, when Peter Reid rang me and said, "Yeah, get him up and sign," I was like, I was actually in the car with my agent, and it was on the speakerphone and. Peter Reid didn't know I was in the car, and when he said get him up here to sign, I was actually in, next to my agent going, as if to say, I don't want to go up there, I don't want to go up there, because I wanted to sign for Ipswich, but it fell through. Um, so, you know, I went home, I spoke to Julie, we were expecting our first baby, and because of what had happened at home, I felt I needed to get away, because um, there's too many reminders, too many memories. Um, so I just went, let's go, let's go. You know, it's an adventure, let's go for it. Um, so, you know, it was, uh, I think, help me scoring on my debut, me scoring virtually every game, week in and week out, made me, made the people, made me feel welcome because they love a goal scorer in the North East. They make you feel like a king. Um, and they certainly did that to me. So I think the transition was very easy because, you know, I was scoring goals. First player since Brian Clough in the early 60s to score 30 goals. So they do like a goal scorer up there. They do, yeah. They've got, you know, they've, I was lucky enough to meet um, Brian um, to, when he presented me with a shirt when I broke his when I broke his record. So you're right, you know they they if you score a goal. I always remember um, Glenn Roder saying to me he'd already he'd, he'd actually left Watford when I left Watford. Um, Graham Taylor was at manager time, and, and I rung Glenn and just said, "Look, I've got a chance to go to Sunderland. What do you think?" And he went, "I'll give you one piece of advice." He says, "It is the best place to play football." when you're doing well, he said, but believe me, it's the worst place to play football when you're not doing well. He said, but if you go up there and score goals and make a name for yourself, he said, you'll have the best time of your career. And he knew that because he, he was obviously connected with Newcastle. Um, so I, that always stuck with me. So I went up there with also that thinking I've got to do well here because we could be back down the A1 pretty soon. Um, so, you know, it certainly the first season was incredible. Ended in a playoff final? Yeah, it ended in heartache, um, wonderful experience, great journey that season, some heart, massive highs, hardly any lows for myself personally and the team. Um, the two playoff games against Sheffield United, I scored the winner in the second leg at home and the noise was just incredible. And then all of a sudden, you, you know, that, God, we're at Wembley. A dream of mine growing up was one, to become a professional, two, to play for England and three, to play at Wembley. Um, and I always remember my sister always ribbing me and digging at me because she got to play at Wembley before I did in a, in a girls football team. So I was very jealous of her and she made it quite well known. Um, so when I knew I was going to be playing at Wembley in a, in a playoff final, I couldn't wait. Um, so yeah, to lose it the way we lost it, for me to come off I think after 65 minutes with cramp because I hadn't trained for about a week up to it because I got, got a dead leg in the second playoff, playoff game so I couldn't do much training. And as, as you know, you've been to Wembley in playoff, that it's a big pitch, it's a, the adrenaline. I just couldn't last the game. So to lose on penalties was a massive low. Um, I went from being there, scoring my 35th goal at Wembley to break Brian's record, um, and then to crying after the game. It was, it was terrible. Um, but having experienced the heartache that I'd already experienced with my, my parents, I felt I, I handled it quite well as time went on and my, my thought and certainly mine and, and the team was when we report back for pre-season, it's forgotten, let's move on, let's kick on and the second season personally was nearly as good, I spent a bit injured but the terms of the football and the way we won the league was, was outstanding. Brands TV meets, from the coaching staff, Kevin Phillips. Just on the playoff final before we move on to the promotion season, for those that don't remember, 4-all it finished against four Charlton? All. Yeah, 4 all, and it, you know, it, we scored, they scored, we scored, they scored. It was just incredible game. 
Um, and I remember when I came off, Bobby Saxon, our assistant manager, was like, he said, this is like kamikaze defending. It's amateurish, because every time Charlton attacked us, they scored. Every time we attacked them, we scored. Um, so, you know, and ironically, the lad that scores the hat-trick for Charlton is born and bred from Sunderland, Clive Mendonca. So it, it was a bizarre game, and I think it's probably gone down as one of the best playoff final games of, of all time. And uh, I just disappointed I never took part in the, in, in the penalty shootout. Yeah, let's not skirt over the penalty shootout because yeah. that just went on and on. It did, yeah. It was, um, you know, I wouldn't say some of them were great penalties, but, you know, in the heat of battle and when the pressure's on, you know, for it to go on and on that long just shows that the players were dealing with it. And, and unfortunately, the way we lost it with a penalty that was taken with, with Michael Gray was... You know, it was a it was a soft, tough. But you know, he he, he had the the courage to stand up and take it. He didn't want to take a penalty. He's a defender, uh, and unfortunately, Sasserilli just could have thrown his hat on it. Actually, um, and so it was disappointing to lose lose in that manner. It was horrible because he's a Sunderland lad through and through, isn't he? He is, yeah. And I felt for him. And and being a good manager, as all good managers do, after that. Peter Reid took Mickey Groundry's wing for the next three or four days. Now, whether that's a good thing <laughs> or a bad thing... Uh, Probably doesn't remember much about no, it. No, he won't. I think that really helped him. And we were all very supportive of him. And, and, and I remember in a change room afterwards, big Niall Quinn and Kevin Ball stood up. And, you know, this was after about 15, 20 minutes when it was quiet. People were still tears in their eyes. And, he, and they just turned around and said, look, you know, what are we going to do? We're going to sit around and mope about it and, and harp on about it. It's done. It's dusty. We can't do nothing about it. Let's go away, enjoy ourselves, enjoy your break. And then when we report back for pre-season, we do not mention the playoff final. We do not mention last season. We focus on the season here because if we keep the nucleus of the squad and we add to it, you know, we'll come close. And, you know, we actually dominated the league from start to finish that season. It's easy to say those sorts of things in adversity, losing playoff finals in a four-all game that's gone to penalties and, yeah, everybody's down and so on. It's all very well to say it, but actually to put it into practice, and as you say, the following season, to storm through, was some doing. It was, yeah, and I think that summed up the mentality and, and the quality of the players that we had. You know, they showed great strength, um, you know, because people saw us as a scalp. Um, they saw what we achieved the, the, the year before. I think in terms of us as individuals, players wanted to pick themselves against us because they saw that, you know, what we were capable of. I think defenders try to, to up their game and they try to double up on myself and Niall to try and stop us from scoring. So we had to, we say adjust our game, but we had to deal with that as well. Um, deal with being one of the biggest teams in the league um, in terms of stature. So there, there was a lot to overcome, but I just think we were, we were on a roll. Yeah, we suffered heartache in that playoff final, but we played some excellent football going into to the playoffs and the final, we added to the squad, made ourselves stronger and, you know, again, you know, you, you can only be successful if you've got, you know, a good goalkeeper, I think a good spine of the team, uh, I mean, leadership, people that can put the ball in the back of the net and again, you know, I got off to a flying start and me and big Noel Quinn were just banging in goals left, right and centre and, and defences couldn't handle us. So, you know, it went on to be, you know, a record-breaking season in terms of points and goals scored. Um, the only disappointing thing from my point of view was I missed three months of the season, but still managed to score 25 goals. So I firmly believe if I hadn't have been injured, I would have gone on and broke the 35. I'd have got more than 35 goals without a shadow of a doubt. Um, that was the only blip on what was a, an incredible season. And there's England shirts behind you, and during that, you also got an England call-up. I did, yeah. Me and, me and Michael Gray together got called up for the Hungry game. Um, again, as I said to you, you know, my dream was to be a professional, play at Wembley, and play for, for my country. I'd achieved the first two. Now, can I play for my country? And, you know, people kept saying that, you know, you keep doing what you're doing. We know for a fact that Kevin Keegan's got his eye on you. Um, you'll get an opportunity. And I never thought that I'd get the opportunity while playing in the, in, in, I can't remember what it's called, the Nationwide League, I think. We'll it call was it the second division. Second division, yeah. Um, and me and Michael were the only two players who have ever been called up for, for, from the second division. So, you know, I remember the phone call clearly because it was captured on Sky. I was doing a photo shoot down on the beach. Uh, Roker Beach? Yeah, on Roker Beach for, for 
Deodora had set it up because I was sponsored by them at the time. And we were down, before I left the training ground, Peter said, listen, keep your phone on you. We did have mobiles in those days. Uh, um, he said, because, you know, I might need to ring you in a bit because I've got wind that you could be possibly getting called up for the England squad. And I was like, yeah, no chance. So then we get down to the beach and we start walking along the beach doing the interview and, and my phone, I could feel it vibrating in my pocket. And I went to the guy, listen, I'm sorry, I've got to, I've got to answer this because it might be, I'd already told him what, and he said, oh, no, of course. And he, I think he was hoping this is the call because this would be great TV. So I it was Reedy, he said, listen, I've got to congratulate you, you've been called up for England. And it was like, I couldn't believe it. Absolutely couldn't believe it. I was buzzing. Um, I didn't want to finish the rest of the interview. I just wanted to ring the wife. I wanted to ring the family. Um, and I, it was just, I couldn't wait. Couldn't, could, not, could not wait to, to meet up. And it was, a, it was an incredible feeling. So what about your England debut? Uh, it could have gone better. Um, it would have been great to have been at Wembley, but it was away at Hungary. Um, you know, tough place to go. Uh, but yeah, I was picked to start the game. Michael was on the bench. And, you know, to pull that England shirt on was the proudest moment, one of the proudest, if not the proudest moment of my career. Um, you know, lining up in that tunnel, lining up outside a national anthem, you know, lining up alongside some top quality players and looking in the far left hand corner, a big old stadium, you know, like a proper Eastern European stadium that was miles away from the pitch, but you could hear the you know, the England faithful singing, um, and it, it was just amazing. Um, I think we drew the game nil-nil or 1-1, one, one if, you know, I should really know that, but um, because I didn't score, I was a bit disappointed, but I only got managed to get one shot on target from long range and perhaps should have done a bit better. Um, but nevertheless, you know, it was, I'd achieved the goal of playing for my country and it was a, it was a fantastic experience for me. Did rejection at Southampton go through your mind as you were stood in the tunnel? I think so. Um, I think I had all sorts of emotions, you know, from what I'd already experienced with, with, with my mum and dad. Um, experiencing the route that I had getting to where I am now. Um, so, yeah, you know, that it, it was. Um, but, you know, you had to quickly put that to one side. So I've got, I've got, I'm representing my country now and you don't get too many opportunities to do that. And if I don't do myself justice, I might never put pull this shirt on again so I thought I did okay um, when I looked at the marks that I got from some of the media and journalists on that Sunday and Monday some of them were a bit unkind but some of them were were okay so um, you know I thought all in all it wasn't a bad debut from a lad that was still in the second division. But then you're in the Premier League 99-2000 and you and Niall Quinn and Sunderland take it by storm. Again yeah you know it was you know, we had obviously made a big name for ourselves, ourselves in terms of scoring goals and myself individually, um, getting a lot of media attention, you know, a lot of people throwing themselves at you in terms of wanting to do stuff away from football, sponsorships. It, it was just quite remarkable, really, having to deal with a newborn baby as well and moving house because obviously the contracts were getting better and better. So naturally, you know, you want, you want to treat yourself to, you know, he's having a house built at the time as well. So things happen so quickly, um, you know, I had to deal with that as well. But, you know, the biggest thing for me and the biggest thing I think that, that stuck in my mind um, was probably a quote from Rodney Marsh saying he reckoned that I wouldn't score no more than six goals in the Premier League. And that really, really riled me for some reason. Um, I know Did he's you very, say why? No, I just think, you know, he just thought it was too much of a big step up, you know, having, you know, haven't been a professional that long, you know, was in non-league not that long ago, I think it'd be too much of a... And I can understand why he said it, but that really got to me, because all I will ever want to do is try and prove people wrong, as I did, you know, when I left that office down in Southampton. So, you know, I worked even harder that summer, and I remember coming back for pre-season, and I was as fit as I'd ever could be, and I was so excited about playing in the Premier League, playing with the big boys. And when them fixture lists come out, when I was laying on holiday, I remember it, as I do every summer, you can't wait for the fixtures to come out. You go and look at well nowadays, you only have to look on your phone, but then you had to go and buy a paper. Um, and I think it may have been a day old as well. So um, Chelsea away was our first game. You think, oh, blimey, that's not an easy one to start off with. Straight away looking for our first home game was Watford on the Tuesday night. And then I was looking for the, the biggest one of that. The Sunderland season is Newcastle, because uh, I hadn't experienced that. 
Um, so it, I, I was so excited, and but the biggest thing was to try and prove, believe it or not, Rodney Marsh wrong. Well, you certainly did. Um, so let's take you to Pride Park Stadium. It's about September time, was it? Maybe late August, September? Yeah, well, you probably know better than me. I can't, yeah, I don't re recall the date, but yeah, you know, I was, I was in fine form going into to, to every game, really, because I scored. I think the longest I went without a goal was six games in the Premier League, and that was, I was stuck on 29 goals, I think, for six games, and I was desperate to get to the 30. So, yeah, at the beginning of the season, I got off to a fly. I scored two against Watford in the second game. Um, and all of a sudden, at one point, I was sitting top of the, the goal-scoring charts alongside the Shearers, the, the Yorks, the Sheringhams, the Fowlers, the Owens, and Phillips was in there. So it was great. And then, you know, the game at Pride Park, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful venue to play football. And you can see that when teams come and play us now, you know, they up their game because it's generally always full. Um, and all I remember really of that day is obviously the three goals, but we had virtually that whole end, didn't we, the Sunderland supporters? And, and the, the way supporters for Sunderland are incredible. And I think they were close to 7,000 now on that day, and the noise was, was remarkable. And it was just, you know, I think if we'd have took on any, anyone at that time, we'd have probably given a real good game. But yeah, you know, I, I scored a nice hat-trick on that day. and. Uh, you know, that ball certainly sits very proud at home on the mantelpiece. I'm sure it does. <laughs> um, well, Premier League Player of the Month for October, Premier League Golden Boot and European Golden Boot and post-war leading goal scorer for Sunderland. It just all happened, didn't it? It did, yeah, it did. Um, as I say, you know, when it, it, it all happened, things came, you know, in such a short period. Um, but I think the biggest thing that season really for me was trying to establish myself a bit more with England, um, which I, prob I did, I was in every squad, I think, for that season. Um, and also trying to get to that, the closer I got to the 30 goal mark, I really wanted to get in, into the 30 club in, in the Premier League. So I think there was only about four players at the time that had done it. Um, and as I said earlier, you know, I was stuck on 29 goals. I got to 29 relatively quick. I was on 20 at Christmas already. And I just thought, it's easy. I'm easily going to get another 10 from now to the end of the season. But I was stuck on 29 for quite a few games. And all of a sudden, it was playing, you know, playing on my mind. Um, and I wanted to get in there because I thought, you know, there's not going to be many more opportunities to get 30 goals in the Premier League um, because it's getting harder and harder. And we look at players now, you know, it's extremely difficult now to players to get, you know, anywhere near it. Um, so I remember it clearly, West Ham at home. Started the move off, Why played it out wide to Nicky Sunby, crosses it in, I get on the end of it, 30 goals, and it was just elation. I'd done it, got to 30, won the Premier League Golden Boot, and then I was presented second from last game of the season with a European Golden Boot as well, which well, they actually called it European Golden Shoe, believe it or not. Um, but so, you know, many accolades come my way, many individual things I won at Sunderland in terms of player of the month, supporters, branches, player of the, player of the month, player of the years. It was, it, was, it, it was quite incredible. And again, you know, I was re rewarded with, it wasn't just a good, it was a lucrative contract at the time because there were clubs starting to sniff. And I know that Aston Villa had put a £15 million bid in for me, um, but I didn't want to go anywhere. So something at the time, so Bob Murray and Peter Reid rewarded me very, very nicely. What about the goal at Newcastle? Come on, we haven't talked about Yeah, that. well, as I said, you know, the, the fixtures that I looked for were first game of the season, who we got, first home game, Boxing Day, because no one wants to travel Christmas night. But the big one for, for Sunderland is, is Newcastle. And at St James. At St James. I'd played there two years now, and all I ever hear, all I ever heard anyone talk about was the derby. And I just thought, it can't be that good. Uh, and I'd experienced some good nights at the stadium, like some great away days, but they keep telling me that the, you'll experience nothing like it. So, of course, you know, that came around pretty quick in, in the start of the season. And, and again, I went into it in fine form. You know, um, I hear that the, the Newcastle faithful were, were fearing me and Quinny. So we didn't want to let them down. Um, and it was an incredible night, just an incredible atmosphere. It was absolutely tipping it down with rain. The game, if it had gone on for any longer than 10 minutes more, it would have been called off. Shearer had been dropped. Duncan Ferguson had been dropped to the bench. Rude Hullett was under pressure. 
it, everything was falling in our favour and you know I, I managed to score you know for me what's probably one of my goals of my Sunderland career away at St James it turns out to be the winner and although you know I'd scored nearly 60 odd goals already for Sunderland I still part of me didn't feel like I was part of the furniture I was probably going to be you know they were, people were calling me a club legendary but I didn't actually feel that until I scored that winning goal against the, 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 that, the team that they, they hate the most. And from that moment on, you know, it was, it was kind of crazy wherever I went after that, but it was great. Eventually Sunderland does come to an end and you get to go to Southampton where you had four managers in a year according to my notes. I did, yeah, and, and Kevin Summerfield was one of the assistant managers with Paul Sturrock, so um, yeah, it was, I think first and foremost, it finished quite, you know, on, on a sad note, Sunderland getting relegated, um, and, but even then, you know, I didn't really want to move on, but financially, as I said, because they'd rewarded me, you know, I had to, I had to be sacrificed in terms of, because of the money I was earning, you know, it couldn't, couldn't continue in the, in the championship, and you know, so it, it was time to move on and uh, it, unbelievable really how, you know, things come around, you know, you get released as an 18-year-old kid at Southampton being told, you, you know, you, you're not good enough to come back, you know, and as a right back, you go there as a striker, but to come back all them years later for, I think it was 3.25 million as one of their, you know, at the time was a, was a, was a big signing for the club, um, was, was incredible. I was given the magic knoll in the massive task of filling Matt Letizia's shirt in number seven so straight away the pressure was on um, but it was an exciting new adventure again you know so I dove in dove into it with both both feet me and the wife family from one end of the country down to the other and it got off to a fantastic start again I came off the bench in my second game sc scored a screamer from 25 yards away at Leicester all places it was their I think their first home game in the in the King Power um, and then I created the second one and we drew 2-2 so I, I, I endeared myself to the supporters straight away um, and but unfortunately you know Gordon left Strachan left pretty soon after that because things didn't go particularly that well so it was a bit of a turbulent first year in terms of the managers and ultimately two years later I left and unfortunately Southampton got relegated. So you move on have several moves but during that time, you score your 200th goal. Yeah, well, the goals were still, you know, they weren't coming as, as quickly as they were at Sunderland. Uh, you know, I still, I think, you know, when you look at my goals per game ratio um, up until that point, you know, up to when I left Southampton w was very good. Um, I think it was one in two. Um, and they were coming quick. Um, so, yeah, the, the 200th goal soon came round. You know, once I got to the 100, you start thinking, right, how, how can I get to my 200th? Can then can you get to your 300th? Never quite managed the 300, but um, yeah, you know, it was, a, it was a great achievement. And, you know, wherever I went after Southampton, I went at a fantastic, you know, not a great time at Villa, I only had a season there, but then moved to, to, to West Brom and scored a lot of goals for them, had a great two years there. Um, and then, you know, as, as I got later on in my career, you know, I, I think at 38 or 39 at Blackpool, I scored 18 goals that season. I was top goal scorer at 38, or I think I was 39, um, which for me, it became more of a personal pride thing then. Um, but, you know, I soon got round to the 250 and, you know, goals were just racking up still, so it was great. You'd suffered playoff heartache with Sunderland, and again, don't want to bring it up, but also playoff defeat with West Brom, yeah. unbelievably. Yes, it was, and uh, you know, against ours truly, uh, um, I would have to say, and I, I hope you don't disagree that we probably deserved to win the game oh, on that I'm day. I'm afraid I couldn't <laughs> disagree with you. But, uh, Absolutely battered yeah, Derby that and, day. But it was just one of those, isn't it? I've played in many games where you've dominated a game of football and you've walked off. How, the heck, how have we lost that football match? But it's about taking opportunities, and and Derby did that that day with Pearson. Um, so yeah, it, it was disappointing because. You know, again, like the f second season at Sunderland, we played some incredible stuff that season. Um, you know, I was scoring goals for fun. And, and, and I think even to this day, and, you know, I do, I do a local column for, for a local paper in, in the West Bromwich and Wolverhampton area. And I think a lot of the sport still say that, 
that two seasons under Mowbray were some of the best football they've seen down at the Hawthorns. We managed to get to the FA Cup semi-final as well and, and we battered Portsmouth that day who went on to win it. So we just couldn't quite get over the line at Wembley. So yeah, it was just, it was heartache again. And I remember when that final whistle went and the Derby players ran off to their supporters and again, we're slumped to the floor. And at that point, I just thought, I don't want to play here anymore. You know, I was lucky enough to play at the new Wembley in the FA Cup semi in that player final. Just thought, I don't want to play here anymore. And ironically, I go back, I think, two seat with Blackpool and we lose again. Um, so it was a very tough place for me to, to experience. But eventually I got my own back when, when we won uh, for, for Crystal Palace. Yeah, and you scored the winning goal. Yeah, I scored the winning goal. It was, uh, it was, people always told me that, you know, you probably, when you interviewed the Derby players after, it's the best way to get promoted. I couldn't believe that, no way, because I'd lost in three playoff finals. But believe me, when, when that final whistle goes and you have one at Wembley in front of your own supporters, it was incredible. I experienced winning the playoff, uh, the, the cup final with Birmingham. And I had an experience, you know, elation, you know, what the atmosphere is like to win a game there. And once that whistle went, it was, in, it was incredible, the noise. And uh, I think it meant, meant more to me because I'd lost so many there, there before. So it was, uh, yeah, it was great to finally get, get a win. Leicester City are on the march to the Premier League. Nobody could have quite believed what would happen two seasons later. And you got a call from Nigel Pearson. Would you just come and help us over the line? Yes. Um, so, yeah, it was... You know, I, I, as I say, I had that season at Blackpool, got me 18, top goal scorer. Season starts afterwards and Ian Holloway quite soon leaves the football club. Things weren't going too well and part of me, part of my heart, because I got on so well with Ian, um, had probably left the football club as well. New, new regime come in, wasn't, you know, wasn't playing as much as I liked. So it got to January and Ian actually went to, to, to Palace, went with Ian to Palace, you know, had a fantastic year, their player finals, sampled six sorry from July to, to January in the Premier League which was great Pulis come on it was time to move on um, and I had that conversation with as I told you earlier Craig Shakespeare walking down the side at, 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 um, at Palace saying you know at some point would you fancy coming into coaching and part of me I remember the conversation so Nigel rung me they knew that I was leaving and I met them at a hotel in Stoke the night before they played a game and sat down with Nigel and he said, listen, first and foremost, I'd like to sign you as a player. He said, but I'd like you to come in as a, as a striker coach as well. And I was like, I can't, I don't want to do both, Nigel. I said, I'd rather come here as I've always been committed and, and give it 100%. If I'm coming here as a player, I want to come here focused as a player. If I'm coming here as a coach, forget about, I want to, I said, but rather come and play at the moment. I still feel I could do a job. So he said, no problem. He said, come as a player, get to the end of the season, and then we'll look at it again. So come in, got a couple of crucial goals, goals um, helped the team get promoted, and it was time to retire. Um, and Nigel still, to his word, offered me the coaching role, and um, it was great. You know, I retired from playing. I thought it was the right time, having been promoted again, I think the fifth time, the, I think the most any player has been promoted out of the Championship to the Premier League. So I just felt it was the right time and it's because there was a nice job waiting for me uh, when we reported back pre-season. So Leicester survive against all the odds in the Premier League, but you get a phone call from a new manager at Derby and you got the choice, presumably stay at Leicester or come to Derby. And you leave Leicester. <laughs> Please, I haven't got over it yet. So I've just started. And I mean, Staying up, the way Leicester stayed up was remarkable, but what happened the following season was mm. unbelievable. And you've left that behind to come coaching at Derby and let's change at Derby. Just replay the last sort of couple of years in your mind. Yeah, well, of course, you know, no one ever foresaw or foreseen Leicester to go on and win the Premier League. I think the achievement that we had staying in the Premier League and the way we survived was... was the best, you know, in the Premier League's ever seen, you know, it was remarkable. We were bottom of the league for virtually the whole of the season. Christmas time, you know, stats have showed us, I think it was only West Brom that were bottom of the league in the Premier League and survived. So the stats were against us, um, history is against us. Um, you know, we were right up against it. The pressure was on week in and week out because we had to get results. 
Um, but we tried everything. We had meeting after meeting. We tried to change the system. We tried playing players in play positions they haven't played in. It, it just, we tried everything because we had to. Um, and, and then all of a sudden we found a system that worked with the five at the back. Got two strikers on the pitch. And obviously Nuge was one of them who we've got now. Him and Vardy, it, it just worked. We won one game, we won another. And, and before you knew it, ironically again, against me old club Sunderland, we had to go there to get a point. I think it was second from last or third from last game of the season to, to secure safety. And we went there and we drew the game near nil, and it was it was incredible achievement, incredible because everyone had written us off. So it was we you know we're in the Premier League again. Go away, enjoy ourselves, and you know fortunately when we come back, um, Nigel was relieved of his duties. Um, so it was down to me and Craig Shakespeare to take training out in Austria. Um, so, you know, I'd only had a year's coach, and now all of a sudden I'm, I'm working alongside Craig Shakespeare to try and organise training sessions out in Austria. And, and while we were out there, Claudio Ranieri gets appointed as manager. And you automatically start thinking, well, is he going to want to keep us on? But he did, to be fair, he kept all his coaches, kept all the coaching staff, brought his own people in as well. So there was lots of us. So I probably wasn't doing as much on the training ground as I was for the first part of pre season with Craig, and I was really enjoying it, I was very hands on. Um, and when he came in, it was more take a bit of a back step, just taking the odd session here and there. So, you know, we didn't start particularly well. And then I get a call for, I was getting frustrated, and then I get a call out of the blue from, from Paul Clement. And I, I missed the call. Um, and then I listened to my mobile message, and it was, hi, Kevin, it's Paul Clement. Uh, I wonder if you'd be so kind to give us a call. And I'm thinking, this is, I think, is someone winding me up here? Someone, because. Obviously, my lad Alfie had been here for, for two and a bit years, and I just thought, is someone winding me up here because it's one of the parents here? And So I, I brought my phone into training the next day, and I actually said to Craig Shakespeare, who knew Clement, and he just, I said, can you have a listen to that, Craig, just to see if you think it's Paul Clement's uh, accent? And he listened to me, he said, no, that sounds like him. So I rang him back. Hope, part of me was thinking that someone was going to, thought it was a bit of a hoax, but anyway, it wasn't. It didn't turn out to be, and he just said, look, he said, "Would you be interested in, you know, coming to Derby, if we could get it, if we could get it sorted?" And I was like, "Well, I, I need to think about it." But he said, "I'd like to bring you as first team coach, working alongside myself and John Peacock. You'd be, you know, quite hands on. Um, we're a club that's going places, as you well know, with it, with the new owner facilities we've got here, a second to none." So I went away. I spoke to my wife again, and I just said, "What do you think?" She said, "Well." You know, it's it's a good opportunity for you. So I went in. I spoke with Craig Shakespeare the next day. I said before I said spoke to Rainier. I just said, listen, I've got an opportunity of going to Derby, uh, or speak at least speaking to them. And he and I said, what do you think? And he and he went, I think it's a good opportunity for you. If you're going to go there and be more hands on, you don't know how this is going to move forward with with Ranieri. Um, so I went and met Paul here at the training ground, and we hit it off. I agreed there and then to yes I'll come on board got the contract sorted went in the next day said to Ranieri look I've been offered an opp opportunity at Derby I think for my own personal career the next stepping stone I think it's a good opportunity and to be fair to him he was fantastic with it he said no problem he said we'll waive the compensation he said y you're free to go and you know I came in here and started working at Derby so it was a it was a great experience for me no regrets on that um I don't think you can have regrets, Carly. Of course, you know, when Leicester were winning week in and week out and there's a chance of winning the Premier, of course there's part of you wish that you were part of that. Because, you know, how often do you get to, to win the Premier League? But at the time, I made the right decision for myself uh, and my own personal career. Um, but for them to go on and win it was incredible. At one point, I was thinking, I hope you do go on and win it now. Uh, because at least I played some part in helping Jamie Vardy score the goals to get him there because I'd worked so hard with him and when I saw some of the finishes he made it looked like although he didn't show at the time because he's that kind of guy but when I saw some of his finishes I thought you are you are you have listened to what we've been trying to tell you so I, as part of me took you know a, a bit of sense of pride in in, in them winning the, the title. Kevin yeah, it's been fascinating to chat to you. No problem. You now we're sitting in a sauna
Hi, I'm Kev Phillips. Join me on Rams TV to listen to all the highs and lows of my long, illustrious career. I think I joined in the November, December time, and then I broke into the first team in February. So it took me till February to, 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 to make my debut for the first team, and ironically, it was against Sunderland at, at Watford um, on a cold, awful Tuesday night. No. Uh, grass on the pitch um, and we I think we lost the game 1-0 but I thought I did okay for my debut and uh, it was one of the proudest moments of my of my career having my me, me family my mum and dad in the stands watching me because unfortunately that summer my dad passed away and my mum passed away three months after him so I was very lucky that they both got to see me turn professional before they both passed away. Hi, I'm Kev Phillips. Join me on Rams TV to listen to all the highs and lows of my long, illustrious career. Rams TV meets, from the coaching staff, Kevin Mark Phillips. Born 1973, which is when Princess Anne married a Captain Mark Phillips. Are your parents royalists at all? I have to put one thing straight now is I haven't got a middle name, so I do not know where the Rothmans or all these books that I sign, I've never, I haven't got a middle name, so I don't know where the mark has come from. Um, so That's yeah. ruined my story. I know, sorry mate. <laughs> <laughs>